Hello, my name is Victoria and today I will be talking about What I Was by Meg Rosoff. The story starts out with a very short prologue featuring an old man who is reminiscing about the events of his past. He is adrift in time, caught in the year 1962, which he describes as the year he first found love. From then on, the story is told from the perspective of his 16-year-old self, with only occasional interruptions from the old man. The story is set at a boarding school on the coast of East Anglia in 1962. We're told that the narrator has been kicked out of two other boarding schools previously, and that this is sort of his last attempt at a middle-class education. He deplores the rules and regulations of the new school. He complains about his classmates, his professors, the food. He complains a lot, actually. But while he makes a show of being very disdainful of the rules of society, he nonetheless creates his own set of rules throughout the story. There are ten of these in the end, things like trust no one and don't look back. So even as he rejects the rules that have been imposed upon him, he nonetheless needs a certain set of parameters in order to figure out who he is and how he ought to live. One day, while the narrator is out for a run, he lags behind and discovers, on a causeway accessible only at low tide, that there is a boy, roughly his own age, living there, in an old fisherman's hut and with only a cat for company. Instantly, the narrator becomes obsessed with this other boy, Finn, because he imagines that Finn's life is everything he's been dreaming of. Finn doesn't go to school, has to work for a living, and has to forage for his own food in order to survive. And the narrator romanticizes this perceived freedom endlessly. He desires Finn's friendship more than anything, and wants to become an integral part of Finn's life. But in doing so, he realizes, fairly early on, that his interference could very easily upset the fragile balance that Finn has created for himself. Finn is extremely quiet and is clearly very used to his solitude, but the narrator kind of forces his way in and demands Finn's friendship. There is this constant paranoia on the part of the narrator that Finn is only tolerating him, and that maybe he doesn't matter to Finn as much as Finn matters to him. This relationship is paralleled in the narrator's interactions with one of his classmates, Reese. Reese looks up to him in the same way that he admires Finn. Only, while Reese is sort of the friend that he ought to have, Finn is the friend he actually wants. Aside from Reese, though, the narrator really keeps himself separate from the rest of his classmates, thereby setting himself up as an outsider. The reason, by the way, that I keep referring to the narrator or the protagonist is because his name isn't actually disclosed until towards the end of the story, and while I don't think it gives too much away, I still want to respect the author's choice to withhold it. Early on, the narrator describes himself as a hero, at least in the context of his own story, but the sense of power and authority that goes along with this term is eventually transferred to Finn. The narrator sees Finn as an almost saintly figure, and even at one point describes him as a boy king. So Finn isn't only someone he wants to be friends with, or someone he wants to develop a relationship with, he's someone he wants to worship. This shifting, ambiguous relationship was really interesting to me because I felt like I never knew quite where it was going. The narrator has no interest or talent for school, but about halfway through the year, he and his classmates develop an obsession with the Middle Ages. They conceive of it as a time of blood and violence and death, and as his interest in this time period grows, the narrator begins to interpose the events of the past over the landscape and occurrences of the present day. At one point, he and Finn go searching for an underwater city, one that was swept away by a storm centuries ago. And this quest feeds his fascination with destruction and the disintegration of ordinary life. This quest also provides him with a very direct window into the past, and when he looks through it, he is attempting to divine the truth of his current circumstances. I thought the integration of historical and geological themes was really interesting, because even as the older version of the narrator is looking back on the events of his youth, so too is the younger version looking back across centuries to the people and times that came before him. Both versions are searching for a key to explaining their own circumstances, although the answers they find often don't become clear for a long time. The pace did feel a little bit slow at points, but at the same time I think that fit in really well with the story, so it was something I actually really enjoyed. Honestly, I think I might be a little bit biased in judging the story, because it features so many things that I like. It talks about the sea, and time, and history, and geology, and deals with complex character relationships, all things that I really enjoy as a reader. Um, I really admired Rosal's writing about the scenery, and the weather especially, and there was one storm scene towards the end that I thought was really well done. Throughout the story, there is a very definite sense of pathetic fallacy and a sense of the relationship between the land and the atmosphere to the events in the story. This is so obvious that the narrator actually comments upon it at one point. A lot of the drama in the story takes place within the last 30 pages or so, and while I think this kind of short conclusion worked well for the story, there were still a few things left unanswered that I would have liked to be resolved. I would really have liked to know more about the characters and their lives after 1962, but the answers were given are kind of sparse. This is a very atmospheric story, and I read most of it in one sitting, which I think was a good way of approaching it. I'm still not sure how I feel about the conclusion, but I don't know, I sort of like the sense of mystery that the book left me with. I'm very interested in reading more of Meg Rosoff's work, just because I really enjoyed the writing style in this one. Um, I think the next one I read will probably be How I Live Now, just because there's a movie to go along with it. 
But if you have any recommendations as to what book of hers I should read next, or any comments on this story in particular, I would love to hear them because I would like to know if other people loved the story as much as I did. Thank you for watching and I think that's all for now. Bye!